the summer of 1940, a small group of young men and their aircraft were all that seemed to stand between the British people and invasion by the Nazi war machine. In the months that followed, the few of RAF Fighter Command would engage the Luftwaffe in savage aerial combat over southern England. In the summer of 1968, some of those aircraft were in the skies again to help film the classic British feature film, Battle of Britain. Now using unseen footage from the production, this series will tell the real story of the Battle of Britain. After the defeat of France, Britain knew she would be next, that she would have to fight for her own survival. The Nazi onslaught would fall first upon the outnumbered pilots of RAF Fighter Command. morning of the 10th of July, 1940. A German reconnaissance aircraft escorted by ME-109s approaches a convoy of British shipping about to pass through the channel. Six Spitfires from 74 Squadron, based at Hornchurch, are scrambled. Reconnaissance aircraft and its fighter escorts are engaged and driven off. But the Germans are now aware of the convoy's position. They prepare to attack in force. Another RAF squadron scrambles to protect the convoy. British radar detects a substantial buildup of enemy aircraft. A further three British fighter squadrons are scrambled. At 1335, the first RAF squadron arrives over the channel and spots the enemy aircraft. Outnumbered 10 to 1, they attack. We were scrambled. And I came out of cloud for 18,000 feet underneath 51 and nines. And they could see me coming for the last 500 feet of my climb. As I came out of cloud, they hit me from in front behind at the same time. How they did uh, that uh, crashing into each other, I do not know. The Battle of Britain had begun. Other British squadrons join the battle. Though outnumbered, they engage the fighter escorts and break up the bomber formations. My first experience seemed to always be we were being jumped and pulled round and break. In my innocence at the time, I always tried to retain height, so I was probably going round in a circle with very little speed, and I was the only aircraft up there on my own. It was a steep learning curve trying to pick up enemy aircraft. You have to almost adjust your eyesight to it, knowing the performance of your aircraft. For instance, someone would shout break, I'd pull round in a steep turn and stall the aircraft. <laughs> you know, uh, instead of probably diving to get some speed. 
It was learning on the job the whole time. By the end of the day, the RAF had lost six aircraft. The Luftwaffe, 13. No ships had been sunk in the channel. On the day that would later be described by the RAF as the start of the Battle of Britain, the RAF had shown its capability. This was largely thanks to the foresight of one man, Air Chief Marshal Sir Hugh Dowding, Commander-in-Chief of Fighter Command. Dowding was a very austere man. He used to come and visit us at Northfield, but he wasn't uh, the sort of chap you can go up and have a conversation with. He was an intensely sincere man, intensely patriotic, and uh, he loved us, the chaps who did his fighting for him, as though we were children. It was Dowding who, two months earlier, had argued with Churchill about sending RAF fighter squadrons to France. As the German Blitzkrieg drove all before it, Dowding persuaded the Prime Minister that it was more important to preserve fighter strength for the upcoming defence of Britain than to squander it on goodwill gestures to the French. As it was, nearly 500 fighters had already been lost in France and Belgium, and over 250 pilots killed. In Sir Hugh Dowding, we had a superb technician and, and leader, and who had the foresight and wisdom to tackle Churchill, to challenge Churchill, who, who had promised France fighter hurricane squadrons. And Dowding had the foresight that those hurricane squadrons had to be preserved for the defense of Britain. During the time of Dunkirk, fighter squadrons were busy protecting our troops, uh, trying to get out of France at Dunkirk. The army, who were on the beaches at the time trying to get out, were slating the RAF fighter command somewhat because they said they never saw any fighters overhead. What they didn't realize, of course, that if we intercepted their bombers, over there, it would be too late. They'd be dropping their bombs on them. So we had to intercept them way inland over France before they got to Dunkirk. And um, a number were destroyed, of course, that way. And they never got to the beaches. And that's why the army uh, got somewhat fraught, because they couldn't see the fighters. It was during the desperate evacuation from Dunkirk that many RAF pilots had their first taste of the speed and intensity of modern air combat. We were about 15,000 feet and flying around, uh, not seeing anything at all. Then, without any warning at all, suddenly the sky was full of Messerschmitt 109s with yellow noses swastikas and big black crosses on them. And this was very much a moment of truth because we hadn't seen them coming and they just appeared like that. Um, unfortunately, I was shot up and I managed to get away and escape. What General Vagan has called the Battle of France is over. The Battle of Britain is about to begin. Two months on from the miracle of Dunkirk, the experience gleaned in those early encounters with the Luftwaffe would be sorely needed. Now Britain stood alone, and it was for her very existence that she fought. The Luftwaffe continues to harass shipping in the channel, hoping to draw large numbers of RAF fighters into the air. But Fighter Command refuses the bait, sending only the minimum number of fighters needed to break up and disrupt the enemy attacks.
hitting hard and fast. It is a tactic that seems to be succeeding. At the end of the second day of battle, German losses were more than twice that of fighter command. Hitler was perplexed, irritated. He had swept across Europe and now Britain stood alone. Surely the British would see reason, recognize that the war was lost and seek a negotiated settlement. But Hitler had badly misjudged the mood in Britain. I think the atmosphere about the time of the fall of France was rather strange in that spirit of no one's going to beat us, filtered through everybody. Every attack they'd made, every, every battle they'd fought, they'd, they'd won. In America and all over the world and that sort of thing, there were people who felt, because of what had happened so far, had felt that Germany won't be stopped. They'll, 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 they'll get away with this. Fierce battles continue over the Channel convoys. Keith Park, air officer commanding 11 Group, responsible for the air defense of Southeast England, husbands his resources. He commits his squadron sparingly, but aims to intercept every raid. On this Sunday, the Luftwaffe lost two aircraft, the RAF, four. German seaplanes, clearly marked with a red cross, were rescuing Luftwaffe pilots from the waters of the channel. On the 14th of July, concerned that these planes were also reporting the movements of convoys through the channel, British pilots were ordered to shoot them down. On the 16th of July, 1940, Hitler issued Directive 16. Since England, despite her militarily hopeless situation, still shows no signs of willingness to come to terms, I have decided to prepare a landing operation against England. He made one final appeal to the British, threatening unending suffering and misery, unless they make peace with the Third Reich. Churchill had already given the answer. Britain would fight on if necessary for years, if necessary, alone. After three days of poor weather, air operations have been restricted. But German preparations for the landings continue. Thirteen infantry divisions are ordered to embarkation ports on the French coast. Hitler and his generals knew that the invasion, codenamed Operation Sea Lion, could not proceed without air superiority over southern England. The fight against the British Air Force must have top priority, to break the will of the people to resist and force the government to capitulate. The landing will be the death blow to an England already paralyzed and no longer capable of fighting in the air. Luftwaffe attacks on channel convoys and ports continue. German pilots intend to lure fighter command into mass combat over the waters of the channel. Uh, and we have always waited that the English Jäger would come so that we had a luftkampf to come to them. But the English were clever enough to be when they saw that there were a lot of German Jäger in the air, then they were just not started. And so we had we have that gemerkt, they come only high when the danger of bombing besteht. The commander-in-chief of the Luftwaffe was confident of success. 
Reich Marshal Hermann Göring was ruthless, ambitious, and vain, a man of innate cunning with an addiction to morphine. His forceful personality had driven the expansion of the Luftwaffe in the years leading up to the outbreak of war. He considered the Luftwaffe to be his air force, and he its absolute master. He also believed the Luftwaffe had proved itself invincible. The simple facts seemed to support his vainglorious assumption. The Luftwaffe had 2,700 operational aircraft. The RAF would meet this threat with a mere 750 modern fighter aircraft. on Britain's coastal shipping continue. The Straits of Dover become known as Hellfire Corner. German dive bombers, heavily escorted by fighters, strike at an eastbound convoy. RAF fighters, vectored into position by ground controllers, attack out of the sun. At the day's end, the RAF have lost three aircraft to the Luftwaffe's nine. The Luftwaffe pilots were learning to respect their opponents. Es mag Sie überraschen, aber ich war nie ein Feind von Engländern. In dem Moment, wo der Kampf begonnen hat, da war es, sah man, denkt man nur an Kampf. Na gut, in, in, bis es soweit war, hat man schon Gedanken gehabt, warum musst du eigentlich jetzt gegen den kämpfen, gegen den du gar nicht kämpfen willst an sich. Aber in dem Moment, wo es dann die Schießerei losging, dann war ja alles vergessen. Entweder er bezwingt mich oder ich bezwinge ihn. Eine andere Möglichkeit gibt es nicht. Dann hat wir gedacht, damit Europa komplett wird, müssen wir England Die kapieren das nicht, dass wir Europa brauchen. Wir werden die als Letztes jetzt auch noch zwingen. Und deswegen müssen wir sie besiegen, besiegen, denn anders lernen die das nicht. With almost 3,000 combat aircraft to hurl against the RAF's stretched resources, Göring remained confident. In his contempt for the RAF, he failed to comprehend that behind the stark figures of aircraft numbers, Britain's shield was far stronger than he imagined. Although the oldest of the RAF senior commanders, Hugh Dowding was well suited to plan and lead the air defense of Great Britain. With his austere and scholarly manner, Dowding seemed to merit the nickname Stuffy, given to him by his pilots. However, he had recognized the important part technology would play in the control of the coming battle. His vision helped develop RDF, radio direction finding, later to be known as radar. The instructions had been given in 1936 to begin building a chain of radar stations covering the threatened coasts of Britain. Fighter Command was a remarkably good organization. The Commander-in-Chief, Stuffy Dowding, was a, a brilliant operator, and he had conceived the whole layout, the whole setup, and, uh, and he ran it perfectly. If Goering had known a little more about his opponent's extraordinary advantage, he might have been shaken out of his complacency, for it was to dramatically redress the Luftwaffe's superior numbers. Radar was, to me, the single biggest technical advance 
that happened in the war until the advent of the jet engine. It was very significant in that we had forewarning of the German formations, their size, their height, their direction. We had a lot of advanced information. Radar was absolutely vital because they put us in the right place at the right time. Without it, I think we would have been fighting one arm behind our back. We could hear the people in the buses looking at the aerials out of the window, our, our masts, and remarking on them and wondering what they were. The whole world of radar was totally and completely secret. You could hear these people muttering and mumbling and saying, they do say that that'll stop your watch. And they do say that if you stand in front of the aerials, you'll be safe for the evening with your girlfriend because it makes you sterile. A lot of my good friends have had very large families since working on radar. <laughs> German bombers, escorted by about 50 ME-109s, are engaged by Spitfires from 64 Squadron and Hurricanes from 111 Squadron. There is fierce dogfighting over the coast, from Portsmouth to Dover. Thanks to radar, no RAF patrol is wasted effort. Yeah. Dowding had overseen the creation of a control and reporting system without parallel. As information flowed into fighter command from RDF and ground observation, emerging threats were plotted on map boards. Controllers watched and orchestrated the defense amongst the command groups. 13 group in the north, 10 group to the west, 12 group guarding the east coast and the Midlands. 11 group in the front line of southeast England. It was very exciting to watch a raid beginning to build up. 90 miles, 80 miles away, a few little echoes would appear on the screen. And slowly it would get a bigger and bigger mass, and they were, all these echoes are kind of trembling. They, they, heave up and down all the time, and it got bigger and bigger, and you knew, and it, you, it was part of your job to be able to reckon how many. A raid did build up, well, like a thunderstorm. Somebody would tell you that there were 200 plus, 100 plus, 50 plus coming over. Plotting involved sitting at a large table, which was, was mapped. You would be given a, a, a number which would be the number of aircraft and, and, and where they were. And you would put up the number of aircraft and put it on a block and then put the block to where they actually were. 19 squadron at readiness, scramble. The controller Better would say, two, from readiness three, to four, scramble, three, and off they would go. At Oxford, 310 squadron, Control you to come and give you a sizable plot, give you a, a course to fly on and a height to try and obtain. Which was, you know, gave you a great deal of confidence. Different instructions would go on and these were coming and going the whole time. So the atmosphere was quite electric. Starting from a few aircraft, to suddenly having to put up 250 plus was very, very scary. And then the tannoy would still be on, so we would hear them in battle. Controllers and plotters were expected to work through the most extreme conditions. Controller and the ops be, they would say, you know, um, all right, a raid's building up. I suppose they would see uh, everybody with their tin hats on. There was a, a complete uh, marrying up of uh, the enemy plot and the fighters. Uh, but at least it gave you an idea. It, it saved you uh, twisting your neck around through 360 degrees all the time. You had a, a rough idea where to look. But the plotting uh, was a great help. 
With radar, of course, um, we could it, we could be kept on the ground. The controllers could watch it carefully and then at the right moment press the button and get us up there in the right place at the right time. It soon became obvious to German pilots that something was going on. Or else RAF pilots had developed miraculous powers of navigation. We are teilweise mit den Bomber verbunden zwischen den Wolkenschichten flogen. Also nach oben konnte man nichts sehen, nach unten konnte man nichts sehen. Und plötzlich kamen die Engländer von äh, ganz in bester Position von hinten, in richtiger Position auf uns äh, äh, zugeflogen und haben uns angegriffen. Da wurde uns erstmal bewusst, dass da irgendeine Einrichtung äh, sein muss, die also diese Führungsmöglichkeit ergibt. Und äh, das hat man damals äh, ja noch nicht so gewusst, der, der Engländer gegeben. As air combat over southern England intensified, radar would prove to be a vital asset to the RAF. Shortly before 2 p.m., two Spitfire squadrons and one Hurricane squadron are scrambled to intercept a large German raid on Dover. In the ensuing dogfight, the South African pilot Sailor Milan claims two 109s, one of which is flown by German ace Werner Moros. As the RAF and the Luftwaffe become locked in daily duels, British pilots learn to appreciate the qualities of their modern fighter aircraft. One day, the Spitfire landed on the airfield and taxed it over to our hangar. And we sat in this thing, and we walked around it, we stroked it. I fell a bit in love with this airplane. It was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. And it was a fighter. You fell in love with Spitfire the moment you see it. And the moment you fly and enjoy it, you've had it. That's his new aircraft. Spitfire excelled, but under extreme conditions. It responded, whatever the conditions of flight, whatever the conditions of load, whatever the speed or angle, it would give you fair warning that it was being abused. And you could do things with a, with a, with a Spitfire that certainly I've never been able to do with any other aircraft. You don't fly a Spitfire, you just strap it on and fly. It is the most beautiful aircraft I have ever flown in my life. You had to be uh, careful on the ground because you had such a narrow undercarriage and it tended to be nose heavy. But once you got the aircraft into the air, it was uh, a wonderful aircraft to fly. The Spitfire had entered service in 1938, only one year before the outbreak of war. Its elegant lines, high speed, and outstanding maneuverability made it an instant hit with RAF pilots. It was a match for the best German aircraft. But throughout the summer of 1940, it was the Hawker Hurricane that comprised the greater part of RAF fighter strength. I would prefer it fighting a war in a hurricane that is Spitfire. The hurricane, what do they have to fly? If docile, easy to handle, easy to maneuver, wonderful aerobatic. Yeah. And the one thing about it was, you had to do a very tight turning circle. It was a good old workhorse. It would take an awful lot of punishment, and you had faith in the aircraft. The hurricane was a good, solid, rugged aircraft. It was really responsive to one's mood and feeling and just fitted in. Although the Spitfire dominates the popular memory of the Battle of Britain, far more hurricanes were in the skies over England. 19 squadrons were equipped with Spitfires, but 34 flew hurricanes.
Opposing them was the ME-109, the Luftwaffe's single-engined fighter. Both the machine and a significant number of German pilots had seen combat with the Condor Legion in the Spanish Civil War. Unequal then, it would now meet its match in the Spitfire. But although the Spitfire was faster and more maneuverable, the ME-109 could climb and dive faster and was far superior at very high altitudes. We are the first ME-109 Flugzeuge, also the famous Jagdflugzeug, was ja wohl in der größten Menge gebaut wurde mit, wenn ich recht informiert bin, 36.000 Stück sollen da gebaut worden sein. Und die Me 109, die ersten Typen waren also noch relativ leichte Maschinen, die sehr wunderbar geflogen werden konnten, wo es noch Spaß machte mit, mit Kunstflug und solche Sachen, die natürlich auch für einen Piloten. Und da haben wir schon gehört, die Engländer sind erstens mal mutigere Piloten und die haben auch Maschinen, die Hurricane und Spitfire, die sind besser als was ihr bis jetzt als Gegner hatten. Ich dachte sogar, meine Me 109 ist besser und kann mehr als die Maschinen. Aber unsere Hauptsorge, meine Hauptsorge, war immer Benzin. Wir hatten ja nur 400 Liter für die Verteidigung. Und wenn wir, und fliegen Sie mal mit wenig Gas im Luftkampf, wenn wir Vollgas fliegen mussten im Luftkampf, haben wir in der Stunde 360 Liter gebraucht. Das heißt, wir hatten nur etwa 70 Minuten Benzin. Der erste, für uns äh, ein relativer kurzer Kontakt mit der Royal Air Force, hat uns äh, Hochachtung abge abgefordert, sowohl von der Taktik der Englischen, die Führung von unten, das war gut, zweitens die Taktik in der Luft und drittens die Qualität der Maschinen. The Spitfire was superior to the Messerschmitt in my view. Uh, the Hurricane was not quite as good as the Messerschmitt. The Hurricane could not cope at altitude against the Messerschmitt, uh, but it could outmaneuver it. The Spitfire, I think, was better than the Messerschmitt. There's an argument about this with the Messerschmitt pilots, by the way, so it isn't necessarily true what I'm saying, but it is my belief. <laughs> The most of it was a good aeroplane, and in equal combat, I, it was certainly as good as a hurricane, despite what people say. Its firepower was better than ours, and their pilots were experienced. While some aircraft would make their reputations in the summer of 1940, others would have theirs shattered. In the coming battles, the Junkers 87, the infamous Stuka dive bomber, would prove easy prey for the Spitfires and Hurricanes of the RAF. The Luftwaffe continues its attacks against coastal targets. Four fighter squadrons from 11 Group engage another raid on Dover by about 100 enemy aircraft. Now in constant action, RAF pilots were learning valuable lessons the hard way. The RAF traditionally flew a tight VIC or V formation. Pilots spent more effort maintaining formation than scanning the skies for the enemy. But the Germans flew a far more flexible formation, the Finger 4 or Schwarm formation. An easier formation to fly in, it allowed them to concentrate on the skies around them. Die Engländer sind noch in, in äh, Ketten geflogen, also immer drei Flugzeuge zusammen, ganz eng zusammen, während wir in Rotten und Schwärmen geflogen sind, weit auseinander. Äh, und äh, die Engländer hatten eben den Nachteil, durch dieses enge Flie Fliegen konnte ja nur einer, praktisch der Staffelführer, 
den Luftraum beobachten. Die anderen mussten aufpassen, dass sie nicht zusammengestoßen sind. Während wir äh, durch dieses äh, Schwarm und äh, äh, Rottenfliegen eben schön auseinander äh, geflogen sind und äh, dadurch große taktische Vorteile hatten. Was ich auch noch sagen möchte, die Royal Air Force flog damals auch noch in Freeship Formation, hat dann aber gewechselt auf Vorship, weil das flexibler war. Und das haben wir alles mitgemacht oder miterlebt und äh, hatten auch die, äh, die Vorteile und die Nachteile der Einzelmaschinen erlebt. As the air fighting intensified, factories worked round the clock to produce new aircraft. And the civilian repair organization worked hard to repair damaged machines, rebuilding some 160 aircraft in a week. In some cases, on a while-you-wait basis, ready for flying again the same day. Dowding and Park continued to nurse their fighter strength making full use of the warning command and control systems to give their squadrons every advantage when intercepting much larger enemy formations. 19 squadrons scramble, vector. But now fighter command itself and the weapons upon which it relied were about to become the target. On the 1st of August, Hitler issued Directive 17. The German Air Force is to overcome the British Air Force with all means at its disposal and as soon as possible. The attacks on channel convoys and coastal defences had been only the opening act, skirmishes to test the aerial defence of Britain. Now the Luftwaffe had clear orders and a timetable. The campaign to destroy fighter command and expose Britain to bombing and invasion was about to begin in earnest. In the summer of 1940, Britain possessed the most advanced and sophisticated air defense system in the world. Radar, assisted by the 30,000 volunteers of the Observer Corps and the command and control system which relayed this information, would give the pilots of fighter command a crucial advantage. On the ground, experience was being gained in the cauldron of battle. It was vital that every link in the command and control chain worked. Ground staff and aircrew both learned quickly. Ground control was pretty good, but it wasn't perfect. And although you were say, told to vector 080, 50 bandits ahead, it didn't always work out that way. You were spending most of your time trying to find these damn things. I was number two to the leader, red two. We went up and we patrolled up and down the same heights we told the enemy were, which again was stupid, you want to be above them. We patrolled up and down sun, which is even more stupid. We hadn't worked that one out. In fact, after one occasion, we turned from down sun to up sun to find there's only nine of us left. We started off with 12. Later, we found that uh, one of the pilots had been shot down, killed. Luftwaffe crews prepared their aircraft for an intensive period of operations expected to begin on the 13th of August, codenamed Eagle Day. To pave the way, Goering had ordered an attack on the radar masts. Finally realizing the role of these tall towers and the buildings clustered around them, but maybe not their crucial importance, it was decided to destroy them, denying the RAF whatever information they had been providing. Stuka dive bombers would be assigned the task of knocking out these modern watchtowers. The Stuka, you know, they, they, were, they were really the biggest menace in the Second World War. They not only dive bombing, but also the noise, which was, oh, it was demoralizing.
German aircraft head for the English coast. The British respond with the same limited numbers the Luftwaffe now expect. Spitfires from Biggin Hill are the first into action. Some of the bombers get through and make their attacks. Five radar stations are badly damaged in the attacks. For nearly six hours, there is a massive blind spot in the country's defenses. Next, three of the RAF's forward airfields come under attack. Lymph, Hawkinge and Manston. I looked down and the airfield had disappeared because 30 Dorniers had laid 300 bombs all over it, you see. And all you could see was an enormous splurge of black smoke and grey smoke and brown smoke. And I remember thinking, the silly blighters, what they've done to our airfield, where am I going to land now? Our three-ton lawyer said, Don Clack doesn't take it up to the mess to book in and, you know. Halfway up to the mess, the airfield was raided. The hangars were bombed, they were flattened, and I thought, this is quite a, uh, an exciting sort of time, isn't it? Some Spitfires refueling and rearming are destroyed on the ground. Those that are still airworthy are rushed back into the air in time to catch some of the raiders as they head for home. The RAF airfields at Manston and Hawkinge have been particularly hard hit. And eventually we landed, and uh, I remember racing between the bomb holes, sort of weaving like a dirt track rider between the bomb holes. Nobody was in the least bit upset. I suppose there were a hundred holes on the airfield itself, kind of apart from all the buildings that had been destroyed, including a lot of 25 squadron Blenheims. All the bomb holes were filled in and the unexploded bombs exploded. The thing that I remember particularly about it was that they cut off uh, all the water, so nobody was able to wash for a couple of days. Goering had decreed that the following day, the 13th of August, would be Adlertag, Eagle Day. The all-out aerial onslaught on the British Isles would finally commence. But Eagle Day depended on good weather for maximum impact. The English summer now intervened. Cloud and drizzling rain arrived, reducing the scope of air operations. RAF personnel, meanwhile, worked around the clock, repairing damaged aircraft and filling in cratered runways. Perhaps most importantly, the radar stations were quickly back in service. Despite poor weather, Goering still hoped to deploy all his forces for the great assault of Eagle Day. The British were ready. 
but the attacks on the radar stations and airfields had proved just how vulnerable their defenses were to concentrated German attacks. Now the German pilots received their instructions. Strong fighter escorts were briefed to sweep the skies clear of defending fighters. Bomber crews were allocated their targets. RAF airfields in the south of England and aircraft factories are at the top of the list. Several hundred German aircraft are expected to be involved in this, the beginning of the air campaign to knock Britain out of the war. From Brittany to Norway, Luftwaffe aerodromes are a hive of activity. The first wave of bombers takes to the air, bomb bays loaded with high explosives and incendiaries. Once airborne, they join their massed fighter escorts and together head for Britain. As the defenders rose up to meet the aerial armada, RAF Fighter Command was entering a desperate fight for survival. Bandits ahead! Bandits ahead! Coming home! 